nine times out of ten, they don't have the songs. They don't. The drummer doesn't know how to play it. The bass player doesn't know how to play it. They don't have what they say they're going to have in a week. And I know that if they show up in the studio and they're not prepared, we're wasting their money, my time, and their time, and we're going to get a crappy product. Welcome to the Production Masters Podcast, the philosophies and techniques behind making music according to the Masters of Music Production. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Production Masters Podcast. I'm Owen Gillette from Ice Cocoon and ProductionMasters.net. Today is a very special episode because it's my interview with Motorhead's longtime producer Cameron Webb. And as Motorhead fans will know, today's Lemmy's birthday. So our father who wart in heaven, this one's dedicated to you. But also to everyone, this is a really high value interview. There's uh, Cameron's a really experienced engineer with amazing credits across numerous genres other than just rock. Even though he's quite famously known for being Motorhead's producer, he's also worked with Megadeth and a lot of punk bands like No Effects, Alkaline Trio, our zebra head and early on in his career you'll hear that he also worked with artists like michael jackson kelly clarkson and a whole load of hip-hop artists as well so so i really hope you guys enjoy this as much as i did it was amazing and of course at some stage we had to talk about motorhead so there's a reasonable amount of time that we talk about the experience that was recording lemmy and motorhead in general a fair bit of the discussion centers around that but uh I think talking about those experiences was a way for Cameron to express his philosophies about production and also his approach to mixing both studio recordings and live recordings. So as always, you can subscribe to the Production Masters podcast at iTunes, where I'd love it if you'd leave me a review, and also at Stitcher Radio, and also at YouTube, where you can like and subscribe. So that's about it. Let's get into it. This is my interview with Cameron Webb. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Production Masters. Today I have on the line the master producer, mixing engineer, Cameron Webb. So how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing excellent, and I'm uh, excited to talk to you and talk about my philosophies of recording and working with artists and production engineering, all that kind of stuff. That's awesome. So you've obviously been doing this for a while, and you've developed a lot of your own ideas about how you think this should all be done. So... Let's start with you, maybe let's talk a little bit about your history, sort of where you come from and how you, or how you built up to the point where you were certain about this is the way I think it should go. If you want to talk a bit about your origins, I suppose. I guess, so let me just start with, I mean, basic background. Let me go, let me, if I go way back, it started at age like 14 mm. and someone gave me a bass guitar and they said, learn this Ramon song. And I learned three Ramon songs or someone taught it to me. And then through that, I played in bands, whether it was cover bands, and then uh, I played originals all the way through college, because I went to ch- college at a place called Chico State um, in, in Northern California out here in the U.S. Um, but with that, what I did was, it was kind of a heavy band. It was, it was kind of heavy, kind of punk, sort of. It was, it was a time when, like, Primus was coming out and things like that. And the school was, everyone at the school played kind of more hippie rock. And no one rec- re- would record our band. So I basically found a way to sneak in the studio by enrolling in classes and taking classes. And at that moment, I realized that uh, I enjoyed the studio. I enjoyed putting mics on things. I enjoyed uh, the sounds and then and trying to figure out what things were. And in that beginning stage, I would take records like Pennywise, the, the Blue Album. And I would say, what should a kick drum sound like? And I would listen to that record and when you first start out, it's hard. And, and back then, you, you, there weren't um, there weren't sources where you could just hear a kick drum or hear a snare drum. Um, it was just you just listen to albums or you listen to what was on the radio. And I would sit and I would listen. I would and I would figure out what the kick drum was, and then I would try to match those kick drums and then snare drums and and all the way up the scale. And that's where I first started, like the sonics of the engineering of figuring it out. And in the beginning, y- y- you're not there's not as much production because you're just trying to figure out whatever it is, but there is visions. Like I had visions of what I wanted the band to sound like. I would want it to be more like Pantera than I would want it like, uh, like a, a like Pearl Jam or something. So, 
Mm. I started it with that, and then once I finished college and got done with all that, I started working at a big studio in L.A. called Larrabee Sound. And Larrabee was like, it has a lot of, it had a lot of pop, had a lot of hip hop. I mean, I worked, there was like Dr. Dre and Snoop and Madonna and Michael Jackson. But the reason why I got the job there is because a guy named Terry Date was producing records and he would mix a lot of his records out of there. And I loved Terry Date's sound because at the time, he, it was a kind of a triggered sound for Pantera and White Zombie and Deftones that it wasn't as easy to do at that time. It was, it was a very difficult sound to master. So he was kind of the master of, of all those sounds. And luckily, I got a job there, and he worked there, and I and eventually started. Um, I worked on a couple albums with him as an assistant engineer. So that's the first. That's right where I started to watch and say, okay, first I'm gonna I'm gonna look and see what this guy does on the board. I'm gonna see how he turns the EQs and see how he turns the compression, and and I'm gonna listen. What does he listen for? And he would solo things up, and I would be right there. And I mean, my job was basically p- plugging in cables and microphones and getting him coffee or whatever it was but I was able to sit in that room with someone who I thought was a master as well as there were a lot of other producers and engineers that were coming through there so that's when I first started to see what an engineer did and then I would see what a producer did and I was lucky because all those people were really 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 high caliber they're working on the top records so um, it was fortunate for me to, to sit in on a Michael Jackson session you're like it's like it was insane to be there in the room with this person who'd, who'd sold so many records. But not only was I excited about that, but I was watching the people in charge, the engineers and the producers, and figuring out what it was. So that was kind of my first stage of, of learning. And originally, I was more interested in becoming an engineer. But as I worked and worked, and so, oh, go ahead. So just how did you get into that level and that stage of it so fast? Or how did you go sort of straight to that? So what happened was I... Uh, I graduated college and I was lost. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, well, I had a degree in communications with an option in media arts, so that's media and television basically. Yeah. And I had a minor in recording arts because all the classes I took to get in the studio got me a mar- minor in, in that side of music. Um, so, but it, I was probably more interested in TV and film at that point, and I worked on like a, a couple like low budget films. And at one point, a, a friend of mine who went to the same school had been working at Larrabee for a year, and he said, hey, Cameron, you have a job? And I said, no, I don't have a job. He says, well, there's a runner job that just opened up, and if you want the job, um, I'll talk to the studio manager, and it's yours. So I showed up, and they interviewed me, and the lady didn't want to give me a job because I didn't live close to the studio. So my buddy <laughs> who worked there, his name is, is uh, Steve Boffman. He's a big mixer. He goes to the, the owner and says, you're an idiot if you don't hire this guy. He'll be the best assistant you've had in, in 20 years. So I got a phone call back, and I got hired because of the owner. Um, so at first, though, I mean, I, I was a runner. So what a runner does is your job at the big studios is to clean the toilets, uh, vacuum. So you show up first thing in the morning. First thing you do, you show up, you clean, you go to the supermarket, you get a deli tray or you get food, and you stock coffee and do all that kind of stuff. And throughout the day, when someone wants food, they say, hey, where's Cameron? And I pop up and I, I write what they need, and then I go get that food and, and uh, clean stuff up. And I basically, I did that for about eight months. And uh, the interesting thing about that is that I hated that job. That job was terrible. You, you, had, you did all the worst stuff. I wanted to be in the rooms. So what I would do is when I had free time, um, at the time that studio had SSLs. They were all SSLs. And they had the newest uh, J9000 that mm. not very many people knew how to use. So I would sit in the tech shop, and I would just read the manuals, and I would learn. And I became friends with the techs there and because I was just nice to them. If they needed something, I would get it for them. But they started to teach me little things. So a lot of times that job lasted for about two years for most people. And I hated it so much that I said, you know what? I'm going to get in and out of this as fast as I can. So I was the best – Assist. I mean, I was the best runner that was that was there. I worked my. I worked so hard, and there was a couple of runners that I ended up passing up. But it was just because a couple of people said, "Why do you work so hard? You need to not work so hard. You're making us look bad." And I would tell them, "I was like, I don't want this job. This job sucks. Like, I want to do something. I want to be in that room, sitting with those people, watching those people, and and see what's going on, and and 
fortunate enough, eight months comes by and they asked a couple of assistants, hey, do you want to work this session? And they all said no. And I stood up, didn't know what I was doing. I said, I'll do it and, and I'll figure it out. And I had a tech there who said, hey, you know what? I'll back you up. If you have trouble, you just come knock on the door and I'll, I'll set you up. So that's kind of how I, I got into that phase. And don't get me wrong, the, the job's not glam. Who was that session? Oh, go ahead. Who were you assisting on that session? Uh, one of the first sessions, um, it was a guy named Butch. I think it's Butch Smalls. So, so Butch Smalls was the percussionist for Parliament Funkadelic in the 70s. Um, and I was a huge Funkadelic fan. So whenever he'd come through the door, I'd ask him all these questions. And, and Butch kind of took a liking to me. So they said, oh, yeah, Cameron will be fine on this session. The session was kind of a train wreck, and I kind of screwed things up, but he liked me. So <laughs> he, it, next time he came through, he, he, he brought me back in, and he realized that I was learning. And so he, he didn't get that down on me. But he, the, biggest, the most important thing is, and I didn't even realize it then, it was the social aspect that I could hang with these guys that were totally different than me, but we got along great. So that, that was like a huge a huge uh, moment where all of a sudden now I was in the room and I got to watch what was going on. So that so it's not a glamorous job where, where I started, but even as an, an assistant, it wasn't very glamorous. Like people think, oh, now you're in the room, now it's easy. I would show up at uh, 10 in the morning and sometimes I wouldn't leave till six in the morning. And then the next day I'd have to show up at 10 again. So I would literally, I mean, I'd work six, seven days a week. Uh, sometimes I logged in like over a hundred hours a week. Uh, most weeks, wow. so it was it was tiring. It was, yeah, right. It was hard, but I learned a ton over a shorter period of time. Yeah, right. So that was the studio that you uh, you sat in on for the Dre sessions or the Michael Jackson that sort of thing at that studio. That was at that studio. Yeah, there was. I spent like over a couple months sitting with Dr. Dre, and he'd come in, uh, and I would just watch him work on beats or bring beats in or mix songs or uh, bring in new artists. Uh, I remember at that point. He brought in an artist named Eve, um, and Eve's like a big rapper, a huge rapper. Yeah. And she, at that point, was was brand new, and we did a song called Eve of Destruction. And what they were doing is they were just testing her out to see if it was right for Aftermath and for Dr. Dre. And I think she ended up not doing a deal with them, and, they, and she went with, like, I think it was Rough Riders or something. So here's the funny thing. All that experience that I had, so there was, a, there was more rap and hip-hop then I wanted to work on. I wanted to work on rock and heavy stuff. But I was lucky because yep. I, I made a lot of mistakes then. And the clientele at that time, it wasn't really the clientele I was searching for. So some of my mistakes, I think, were, were kind of more forgotten. And by the time I had got to work with the Terry Date or people like that or Don Gilmore, I'd learned a lot and I, I was way more experienced. And uh, for those people that I was really trying to impress, I was able to impress them a lot better. Awesome. And were any of those experiences part of the origin of how you approached recording rock bands? Was that partly the experience with Terry Date that made you think like that? Well, you know, it's funny. So with rock bands or with whatever I do, I think part of that experience, um, watching even all the hip hop and all that kind of stuff that was going on, I learned, uh, like I liked, I liked, I, I came from, I was a bass player originally. So I liked fullness i like bottom end i like things to, to to be where you could turn them up really loud and it doesn't hurt your ears so i think i experienced yep. a lot of of learning of bottom end on those rap sessions and those hip-hop sessions how they were compressing so they could turn it up loud and it would punch the speakers really well so when i started working on rock records which i was always doing on the side anyways i had a tendency to to, to push the bottom as far as i could and to compress it better and and uh i there were skills there that a normal guy who's just doing rock drums every day would never have known, and and so I actually I'm ex I'm glad that I learned all that because it's 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 one of the biggest things. When I mix, I kind of turn up loud uh, when I'm mixing because I know when I take it to the car, a kid's gonna take it and turn it up loud if it's that kind of music, if it's heavier rock. So yeah, if you turn it up loud and you're in your car and your and your ears hurt and you and you have to turn it down, that to me is not a good mix. I want something that can be turned up loud and listen. And, and it needs to be good when you turn it down quiet too, but it'll have a different thing. It, it will, you won't be over-EQing everything um, if you're turning it up louder. Yeah, I actually, 
I bought the Motorhead electricity breakdown that you did with I can't that, remember who that's it was Warren with, Hewitt. But, um, that's the, oh, so that, watching all those videos. Sorry, that was that was with Warren Hewitt, the the person I was talking about before. Oh right, yeah, yeah, and that was really interesting seeing really seeing into your approach and all of that. It was surprising to see how little surgical sort of EQ there is. Um, I mean, obviously it follows on from getting it right to start with, but then everything's more of a broad brush strokes sort of approach. Yeah. So it's, it's what it seems like it's when you, uh, before we we started this, you, you, you asked a question about, um, uh, about committing. And basically when you look at that, that electricity video, I had a couple of people comment and said, you don't really do much Cameron. And I said, did you listen to the tones? Did you listen to each individual tone? It's like when I got those tones, I was on a Neve. I was an 80 series Neve at NRG and I was dialing in. I was EQing. I was compressing and I was choosing the sound that I wanted for the record as I was tracking. I wasn't worried about it later. I was choosing the drums. I was choosing the cu- guitars. And um, when it comes to the drums, it's EQ and compression as I go down, but not over EQ. So it's more often it's, it's scooping EQs out. And uh, mm. when it comes to guitars, I almost never EQ a guitar. I'll EQ it on the amps. If if it's if it's not bright enough, then let's turn it on the amp up. I don't do it on the board because I don't think it's the way to do it. I think later on when you're mixing, yeah, you add a little high end, you scoop lows out or low mids, whatever, whatever you like or don't like. But in general, if you take something that I'm tracking and you just listen to it and you take it to the car that night, it's going to sound pretty good and it's going to sound close to the vision, um, and then it'll just get a little more slicked up when it gets mixed. So. I'm a huge fan of committal because the reason here's the biggest thing about committing is nowadays no one wants to commit. They just they'll give me stuff to mix and they'll say, "Oh, I was just saving that for later. I don't it doesn't sound very good because I was just waiting." And I'm like, "What are you waiting for? Like just listen to your speakers and choose the sounds you want and you're going to make mistakes. Like I made tons of mistakes when I first started, but mm. I saw visions. I had a vision for the sound. I had a vision for the song. And if you don't have that vision, you're kind of just shooting in the dark. And you, you're never going to get a product that you're, like, excited about because you're just guessing. And that's a terrible way to go about life. That's a terrible way to go about recording for sure. And if and if you want to develop your ideas of how that should go, I guess just I guess listening to lots of good recordings is a good place to start. Bingo. <laughs> That's the most important <laughs> thing. Like, ser- yeah, I have people that send me mixes, like friends who are trying to, they're learning how to do it. And when they'll send me a mix and I'll say, what are you referencing? And they'll say, I've, I'm not listening to anything. And then I'll listen to the mix and it might not sound good. And the first thing I'll say is you need to start listening to things because if you want to sound like Rise Against, listen to Rise Against. If you want it. And when I say sound like Rise Against, I'm not saying sound like the band, but the Sonics. The way the kick drum sounds, how much bottom is in it, the snare drum, how loud the snare drum is, the vocals, where everything sits in, in mm. the context of a mix. Like that's that's what you're shooting for. And and I've A B I mean, Terry Date was a huge influence. So I would put Pantera on, I would put the deft tones on, and I'll just I'll just listen to those songs. And then it, there were times where I was learning where I would copy it. And then it would get to a point where I'm like, I don't want to copy it. I like the idea of it. But now I'm going to make my own Deftones version or whatever, whatever it is, like, and, and choose that style of production. Sure. Because going back to those productions, would you say that they were probably more light on for bottom end than what a lot of the rock productions are now? Uh, you know what? Or, it's so hard to compare anything that's, this tw- that's over 20 years old because – we were kind of listening on different speakers in our cars, in our houses. Um, mm. we're, we're listening in this tens here. I, I mean, some of those records have way, bo- I, it's just, it's different. It, you have to compare a specific record because you, you look at like, uh, I, I, can't, I, I don't even want to say this, but like you look at Nevermind and you listen to that record, it's phenomenal. It's one of my all time favorite records, favorite sounding records. It doesn't have a ton of bottom end. Yeah. Um, and, you listen to records now that have more bottom end, but that record was it was special for the time. For the time, that was a phenomenal sounding record, and it still sounds great to, today. It's an, it's an incredible uh, production, Sonics, everything about it is so special, and and it attached with uh, people. People loved it, and 
whether you say there's more or less bottom in now, for sure, it's it was a different time. You can't even you can't compare that so much. But so it's funny. I bring that up. Andy Wallace, one of my all time favorite mixers. Um, I mm. he's one, someone that I would a b a b against all day long for the last twenty years. So yeah, that's a, a person where he had great bottom end. You turn it up loud and it sounded good. Vocals sat, and he had there was a style and there was a mood to everything he did. When it comes to Nirvana or Thrice or just I mean you name it, he, he's done so many great records. Lincoln Park, and he's he would always make his drums really punch through as well, you know. And that's a huge thing with me is punchy drums because if you if you have guitars too loud, you can't turn a mix up loud. You need to have those drums that cut through. Yeah. And this and the cool thing about Andy is that he had. Uh, they weren't they they weren't too loud sounding and they weren't too obnoxious. They just he had a way like Rage Against the Machine. You you turn on that record, you just you want to turn it up because that's the way it sounds best. And it's like it's exciting. Yeah. It, those those kind of his mixes have always been exciting. And it's just using compression and using side chain compression to to get all that kind of stuff. And you know he was. I mean, I just assume he was doing but, those. But things. also it was also not overdoing the compression for the overall thing as well it was sort of li allowing a bit more punch of the kick and the snares to come through i think too yeah i and it, it was a different style of production like when you say like nowadays uh people use maxim and they and they use uh, on the stereo bus they basically master it when they're when they're mixing and it's those kind of compressions yeah. where people are just overdoing it and it's so compressed and br and sizzly that you can't turn it up because it's just annoying when it, it turns up loud. And it's it's that kind of production that I'm not a big yeah, fan that's, of. Yeah, that is what I meant. Yeah. I meant that it was the master bus or the mastering compression. Yeah. Um, so just on a tangent, do you do much of your mixing on NS10s since you were talking about NS10s? Yeah, I've been mixing on NS10s since like 90, since I first got introduced to them in like 1996 or whatever. I still, if you look behind me, there's a, there they are. I got a pair of them right there. Yeah, yeah, that's it. The, and so, how much of your, how much time would you spend mixing on them versus the other monitors? Uh, almost a hundred percent of the time is on the NS10s. Um, I very rarely anymore. Here, and here, so let me let me explain this. I run my NS10s with a subwoofer. The key to the NS10s is when I run the subwoofer, now I can feel the bottom end of a mix. So I don't have to go to the Genelex anymore because it used to be, when you don't have a subwoofer, you just it's just such a cutoff. It was just confusing the bottom end. You take it to your car, it's all woofy and it's a mess. Yeah. Um, so once I started doing that, I stepped away from the Genelex because uh, it's it just works. I mean, they sound great together. So I can sit on the NS10s and I've had people come in the studio. It's funny, and they've they've said they they said. These are the best NS tens I've ever heard, and they're like, are they special? And then I would just say, no, no, no. There's, listen, why don't I turn the subwoofer off? And then they're back to the normal NS tens you're used to, and they're like, oh, okay, cool. Well, now I now I understand the sound. But we have morphed so much in on Sonics in the last like ten years, mm. where most people have subwoofers, even their little uh, the, the computer speakers that they have like on their desk. There's a sub, and then there's the two speakers, and and yeah. cars. Car stereos are awesome now. Car stereos 20 years ago were terrible. They they sounded worse than NS10s, and that's just what you got. So uh, the times have changed a lot, and I think, I mean, I still stick with them because I know them, but there'll probably be a time where they're slowly going to disappear because they're just, they don't, they're just, they're a dinosaur kind of. Well, last weekend I was talking to Mike Fraser, who I'm sure you'd know his work, he said he basically only mixes on NS10s with a sub as well. So He has a sub too? Okay, yeah. Yeah, but he only mixes on NS10s with a sub. But, I mean, he doesn't use any other fancy, really big expensive speakers or anything when he's mixing. Yeah. And that's just his thing. You know what it is? The, the biggest thing in the world is it doesn't matter what kind of speakers you have. If you know those speakers and you know how they translate to other sources like the car, it doesn't even matter what you're using. And... I've learned those so well that I know I don't even have to go to the car anymore with, with a lot of stuff I do, but I, I still do for, for more for pleasure, I would say. But uh, yeah, if you learn your source, you can have terrible speakers, but you just they're just harder to work with. The worse they sound, the harder they are to deal with. And it's like the, the, 
the, I mean, every, you've, everyone has said this before, but the Genelex, they sound so good that you don't work as hard to get good sounds. With the NS10s, they sound so crappy that you work so hard to dig in, and all of a sudden, once you make them sound good there, they sound phenomenal everywhere else. And that's the magic of the NS10s. Yep, that's it. Absolutely. That's one thing that you always hear people talk about NS10s with it. They, if you get it good sounding on there, the translation just works. Um, so something I wanted to get to eventually was talking about when you're the producer for a rock band or I guess for, for any kind of music, how do you judge where the line is between how much push and pull there is or how much it's not dead on the grid and or it has a human vibe versus it being sort of a good enough quality to end up being like a commercial release how do you how do you judge that line and um make those decisions you're specifically talking about drums just make when, when well, do you I guess choose to, how I, I guess i'm talking about really the tightness of the whole everyone's performances how human they are versus whether they meet the standard that they need to how do you judge where it needs to be uh you know it's so it's 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 mentally it's difficult to choose because here's the thing um you look at each artist, and if someone comes to you and says, I don't want to spend a lot of time, I just want raw energy. And if they really mean that, then you go in and you do it live and everyone performs and you don't, you don't cut anything and you don't pretty anything up. You let it be loose. But the problem is, is when someone tells you that, they don't always mean that. And that's where you have to, you have to judge how serious they are about how loose or how tight they want things to be. Because... Once you go down a path of a looser sort of recording, if someone starts to get anal and wants things really tight or wants to fly things around or move things, you run into a big problem because mm. you can't do it. And sometimes you can, but you, it's just really difficult. It's really time consuming. So if you shoot down the path of looseness, you need to finish down the path of, path of, path of looseness too. And some of the, my favorite recordings are those looser ones that just have the raw energy and there's an excitement and there's mistakes. Like, and I love that sound, but I have to precurse with whoever I'm working with, like, hey, you, we got to commit. We commit one way or the other. Um, you take a band like Motorhead and they're kind of, uh, they're a unique band. They're, they're raw, but they're also very tight because Mickey D is an amazing drummer, amazingly tight. His meter is good. He hits really hard. Every kick and snare is is great. Yeah. So uh, I think he told me that one of the first records they started using the click tracks was when I started working with them. And it was just because that's just what I was used to doing, and, and, uh, and he was good at it. He could sit right on that click <clears throat> and play a song top to bottom without messing up. So... One of my big things with that question you asked is, here's the thing. If you have drums that are tight, I'll tighten them up so they're what the drummer wanted to play. Because otherwise, you're sitting there all day and the drummer's saying, hey, can you nudge this snare? Can you move this back and forth? So what I'll do is track the drums, and either I or I have a guy named Sergio Chavez that works with me, he'll cut those drums based off of what I want. And I'll... And I'll I'll choose what that drummer wants. But what I'll normally do then is I'll play the tracks for the drummer after I edit it. And I say, what do you think? Does this sound good? Is it too tight? Uh, is it too loose? And they'll listen. And 95% of the time, the drummer will say, wow, I sound good. This is exactly what I want. But here's what this does for me is if I take those drums and they're really tight, t locked onto the grid with the fills, maybe having some push and pulls, um, then when I take bass, I'm not going to be as anal on bass or as guitar. Um, what I'm going to do is there'll be a little bit of looseness within that bass and, bass and drums, but that's what makes the drums not sound so tight. And then I'll do the same with the guitar. Because a lot of people, um, in some productions I'll hear, like kids that are doing demos, they'll tighten up everything so much that it literally just sounds like a drum machine and drum guitars. And it just sounds like garage band. And I'll tell them, I'll be like, listen... You're, you chose to, to make it sound like a robot. Um, they didn't. And to me, I don't want it to sound like a robot. I want to hear the energy with uh, Motorhead. I want to hear Lemmy make some noise and, and hit some weird notes. And um, with all that said, I'm pretty, I was pretty aggressive with Motorhead on, on trying to be tight and, and get everything sounding really, really good. So I, wasn't, I was strict on him. I mean, he'd come in, if the bass wasn't good enough, 
The next day, I'd say, we got to redo that bass today. And the funny thing is, he would look at me and be like, you're insane, Cameron. I'm not going to redo that. <laughs> and then I would play the track for him. And he'd be like, oh, you know what? Maybe you're right. Okay, well, I'll redo it. And then he'd redo it. And so it wasn't me like forcing someone. It was me pointing it out. And if he had chosen to say to me, Cameron, that is exactly my vision. I don't want to change it. I would have left it. Mm. I, I wouldn't have. Yeah. I probably wouldn't have battled anymore. I would have walked away and said, okay, if that's the goal and that's what makes you happy, it's your art. It's You're the band. And, and it, I'm going to trust you here. And this is where the push and pull of a producer comes into play. Um, not overstepping your bounds and not making it the Cameron Webb record, making it Motorhead or Pennywise or whatever, no effects, whatever it's going to be. Because yeah. they got, they're successful for, they were successful before I showed up. So there is something special about those people and about what they do. And I need to let that happen. But I also need to rein them in and, and try to get them to focus and, and make great records too. Um, so I understand you've got that going on between the producer and the band or like you and the band. But do you have in the back of your mind when you know you're delivering something to a label or when there's going to be the, the eyes and the opinions of the wider industry, is that sort of a pressure in the back of your mind that we know it's got to fall in a certain place or, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's in the back of your mind, but it's also like, uh, a lot of the records I do, the people know the other records I've made and they know there's a certain quality that I always kind of hand. Like if you, if you were to take all the records I've done, you're not going to find like a dog one in there that just sounds terrible. It just, it doesn't, I don't think it exists. There's, they sound different. Don't get me wrong. They sound different and they, they capture different mm. aspects. But I, I prided myself being a good engineer as well as a producer. Like part of a producer is choosing a great engineer. And to me, I learned so much from so many people and I, ex and I've, and I do it every day. I've, I've done it every day for the last 20 some years. Um, I feel like I'm a, a competent engineer and um, compared to the people, the younger kids that are out there, I feel like uh, they're just learning and, and I'll see all these mistakes. So for me, I, I don't want to say I get, I don't really get nervous with what the label's going to think because uh, it's more or less the songs. Like if, if you're delivering the songs they want and a lot of the records I do, I prefer to do more records for your Warner Brothers and your Columbia's and big, big labels like that. But I don't get a lot of those records. Those records are really hard to get. I get uh, a lot for Victory Records or Fearless Records or Epitaphs and uh, Fat Records. And they're not as strict on... Um, they, they hire me and say, uh, do, what you, what, do what you think is right and hand it to us. And then that's what I do. And yeah. I also pride myself on mixing because I first started a mixing studio. Um, at Larrabee, it was a mixing studio. So I learned a lot about mixing before I even learned how to track very good. So my tracking is very much like a mix. Like I'm choosing things like, okay, how is this going to fit in the mix? How's my kick drum going to fit in the mix? How's my vocal going to sit in the mix? So I'm choosing those things as I'm tracking um, the whole process. And I worked with a band called Zebrahead. And with Zebrahead, there was a time when mm. it was on Columbia Records. Um, it was a big deal. Um, and they had an a &R guy named uh, Marshall that was working on the record, too. And he had high standards. So to me, between the two of us, we had to keep the vocals tuned and the, the drums locked in. And and uh, and they were looking for pop songs. They were looking for pop punk rock songs. That was going to be my next question was that would there be more pressure when it's like a band's first album or like a an earlier album where they still need to prove themselves? Would there be more even if it's paranoia, wanting them to make a, some sort of a solid impression in that way. But that sort of is what you're saying, I guess. You know, it's weird. I, I don't, I, I don't, I guess I don't feel pressure with those situations because I do a lot, I do records for, for artists, for the artists that are there. So when someone comes to me, they say, Hey, I, I really like the sound of this album. W let's say it's Rage Against the Machine. I'll listen to that record and I'll, and I'll listen to the band and say, well, you're a little different, but I get what you're looking for. So I'll shoot in a direction that the band is looking for. And because most, I mean, if you look at, okay, if you look at Motorhead, Motorhead is an example where they did what they wanted when they wanted. And that's what we did. When we did the albums, 
uh, the, the label never even heard a song until we finished mixing and the record was mastered. And that's usually when they got the record. And Lemmy would say, if they don't like it, don't put it out and we'll just put it somewhere else. And they would always just put it out. And that's a very extreme case. Um, a lot of the other, like smaller bands, you're, you're listening to the competition. You, you take like, mm. there's a band called Close Your Eyes I did. It was kind of a hardcore thing. It was similar to A Day to Remember. So to me, my standard was, okay, we have to shoot for the Day to Remember kind of quality of songs and quality of production. So to me, yes. I, I guess I'm not scared because I'm, I'm, I'm looking from the very beginning on where am I chasing? What am, who's, who's the competition? Who, who do we need to, to be up to par with? And when can it be more free like an At The Drive-In, which is, to me, uh, there's the, the big At The Drive-In record. It's a phenomenal album. That drum's not, those drums aren't edited. It's, it just has raw energy. And to me, it's, like, it's, find, it's finding the blend. Absolutely. Yeah, it totally communicates. I, I love that album. Like it was really <laughs> some the vocals, well, some of the backing vocals aren't even close to being in tune. I'm just like it just didn't nope. matter. It was so, it connected so much. Andy Wallace mixing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Ross Robinson yeah, yeah. producing it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, totally awesome. So something that I've been curious about, which I've been trying to find the information on the internet, but... Who actually did the mastering on Bad Magic? Uh, Bad Magic, that was mastered by a guy named Andrew Aleckel. Andrew Aleckel also did, he mastered Aftershock, um, and then he mastered some Motorhead Live DVDs. Um, Andrew is a great guy. He, he worked at a studio called Grandmaster Studios. So Grandmaster is in downtown Hollywood, and it is known for uh, the big Tool record, Undertow, was done there, and... Uh, the Foo Fighters Color and Shape was done there. Yep. Uh, Queens of the Stone Age. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, if you just type in Grandmaster Studios, it's like you can't believe how many amazing, incredible records uh, were done there. Yeah. And he was an assistant and an engineer there for, uh, for forever. And yep. at some point he left there and started mastering things. And I was working on a – this is funny. I was working on a kids' TV show. And on the kids' TV show, it's called Yo Gabba Gabba. And <laughs> – when I would mix it, I would mix it for TV. So I'd mix things kind of brighter, not as not as full and bottom indie as I liked on a on a daily basis. So they, yeah. they released an album of it. it. Was called Music Is Awesome, and they took it to him to master. And I don't even know why um, we we went to Andrew to master. When I got it back, it was full. It had all this bottom end, and it was. I was like, that's what I wanted my mixes to sound like. And and I'd already known Andrew. We'd, we'd already been friends. So. I started using them all the time, and even I mean, I, I'm using him on th three projects right now. So um, he's mm -hmm. he's great at what he does. Uh, he's he's very organic and very simple. Um, he's not a crusher. He's a he wants things to sound alive, and that's why I use Andrew, and I like him, and he's a great guy. Yeah, it's funny because a couple of weeks ago, when I was putting things together for the interview, I was just quickly trying to listen through the various Motorhead albums that you've done listening to the final frequency balance and i feel like bad magic sort of seems it does feel like it's the most organic it feels like it's the most it's sort of the most punchy as well i think so to okay so let's look at the process of bad magic was different than all the other records i did and the reason why and this is i've said this in interviews before so you might know this but um i wanted it lemmy didn't want to just go in and uh have everyone do their parts he hmm. wanted to write songs as a group is, is all three of them. And they didn't always write songs that way. Like Phil would bring in songs, Mickey would bring in ideas, and Lemmy would bring in ideas. So I put them in a studio together and they had to sit. We didn't actually go into rehearsals. We went right into the studio and they would sit and every day they would work on a new idea. Yeah. And we would finish that idea and if it was good by the end of the day, I would track the drums. Next day, new idea, new idea. So each for two weeks, we did that and we got about 14 or 15 songs out of that process. And part of that, I felt like gave a different kind of life to the record. It, it was a little bit more organic um, in, in the way it started from, from day one. So I feel like when you listen to that, it might have been a little looser, a little more raw. And uh, it's, it's because that's just, it was a choice we made. And don't get me wrong, we overdubbed and we were very precise about what we did, but also we just, uh, 
we wanted to enjoy time. You know what I mean? Lemmy was getting older, and I mm. knew that uh, there wasn't going to be many more opportunities. And I wanted him to be happy. I wanted him to. I didn't want to. The funny thing is, is when we went to go look for a studio for that record, the manager said, "We got to save money. Let's go somewhere cheaper." So I go to this place, and it was so filthy, and it was so ugly, and the electrical cables were popping out of the walls, and there was holes everywhere. And I thought about it. I was like, Lemmy is he's done so much in his life. I would hate for his later period to be stuck in a terrible place like this just because of money. Yeah. And that was when I found Grandmaster and I said, Let's go let's go to Grandmaster. And here's the funny thing. Grandmaster was kind of a beat up studio too. Old carpet, kind of like a sound city thing, where it's from the seventies. It's Okay. And nothing had been changed in in all those years. And I was worried because we just came from a place called NRG, which was very, very clean and nice. I was worried that he wasn't going to want to record there. The funny thing is he walks in the door and he he looks around the place and he goes, oh, I recorded with Dave Grohl in this studio. I like the way things sound here. And he sat down and he was happy to do the whole record there. And I, too, was so excited to do the record there. It was great. Um, It had an old Neve. It has an old 1073 Neve. Uh, uh, amazing condition and tons of good gear. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. The songs do sound, they do feel and sound a bit different. They, um, The previous albums, they seem uh, more like all consistently from the same, they're all from the same set, whereas the last album sounds more like quite different songs all put together, but like in a really cool way. Yeah. So what do you think about amp sims and Kempers and that kind of thing versus actual cabinets? I'm pretty, I can sort of half guess what you're going to say, but. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I try to embrace technology when it comes. I, I really do. Um, I'll take, I'll go back to when Pro Tools first came out and they were, we were still using tape. A lot of people resisted Pro Tools for, for this five year period. And I was like, at this point where I was working at Larrabee in another studio where I said, you know what, I want to learn them both because who knows what's going to happen. And all of a sudden, Pro Tools got better and better, and all of a sudden, Pro Tools sounded great. It didn't sound worse than tape anymore. It sounded, it had more bottom end, it had more high end, and it was more controllable. And I had learned how to use it. So I kind of got a leg up on a couple people who were being stubborn. Um, And now if you Mm. jump to like the Kempers of the world, uh, I'm a little stubborn with that stuff right now because uh, there's there's a charm to putting a mic on a cabinet and putting it in the wrong spot and getting a different sound. And with a Kemper, you're not going to get a different sound. You're going to plug in and you're going to go to the Marshall 800 and it's going to sound like a perfect Marshall 800, like so perfect mm-hmm. and th- more perfect than you could ever get. And does it sound bad? No, it sounds phenomenally good, but... It, there's there's things that when you mic it wrong, you mic it more bottom end and you get a fullness or you'll get a different brightness or you'll get a different sound. And that's what I like. Like I like the you t- go back to the Deftones, those early records. The first Deftones record, that thing sounds crazy, the guitars. But yeah, it, you, you couldn't use it on every record, but on that record, it's spot on. It couldn't be any better. If you had a Kemper on that record, that record would be a little boring. And I also think it's mm-hmm. in my style of production. If you take a Marshall and you have someone play a Marshall, and then you want to do a lead, like a lead guitar over those Marshalls, and they're big rhythm guitars, I don't use the same amp. I wouldn't use the same another Marshall with the same guitar because the problem is you've got too much of the same frequency going on. If you have four guitars that are all coming from the same source, they like if you had a Marshall, I would probably go to like a Fender and I'd plug in a Fender where it has a different bite to it, so. When that fender comes in, it, it jumps on top of the Marshall and it rides it. If you've got a Kemper, mm-hmm. you've got a Marshall and then you're just putting another Marshall, another Marshall, and it's got this graininess that if you put 12 guitars on or whatever, let's put a bunch of guitars on, Yeah, it just becomes a ball of grayness. And don't get me wrong, too much of anything is going to get gray sounding. But uh, I haven't, on on recordings, I haven't said, hey, you know what, I, I'm going to start using Kempers. Um Live, I was talking to uh, the bass bass player for Weezer, and he said that he's been using Kempers <clears throat> because it's so easy to go on tour. You carry this little box, you mm-hmm. show up every place, and you've got the exact same sound. And for live, 
they're great. But for records, uh, yeah. I, I'm not buying it yet. Um, I, I want to accept it, mm-hmm. but I, I don't. The same goes, same concept for the Axe Effects or the various other amp simulators that you can get. Yeah, I mean, I use amp simulators more so for distorting vocals or or messing something up because they're it's the same thing. Like they seem to lack a little bottom end. They yeah. there yeah. tends to be a lot of harshness um, in a mix. There's there's a glue that's kind of missing <clears throat> when you have those kind of things. And some people have gotten better at them where they sound good, but it's just, it's it's like when I get a demo from a kid who's fairly skilled at Pro Tools. He 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 puts good samples on all the drums. He he gets a good Kemper sound for the bass and the guitars. It almost sounds too good, and it just it kind of gets boring. And it's when you want it really good, when you want a pop song and you want it to be really precise. Yeah, maybe maybe for a Katy Perry song that is is really polished, maybe you use it for something that like that, and it's great. But if you're if you're talking like your Motorheads or your Pennywises and and the bands yeah. that I usually work with, I, it's not as much fun either. And I you, you totally there is if someone is just sitting turning that little box every time, it just it's not as fun as hey you know what I'm gonna plug in this other cab and this other amp and watch this and it's gonna blow up and you're like oh whoa <laughs> it's catching on fire it's like oh but get it right now like you're not gonna get that with the Kemper it's never gonna exist you're never gonna I'm not saying never. Like there are ways you could you could do things, pedals or whatever you want to do. So um, mm. you got to understand. Like I, I'm an opinion, and that's all it is. And and I I'm a strong opinion because I've seen a lot of people make mistakes with those things. And and it's it's just like people com- talk about like the slate samples. The slate samples are great, and I use them sometimes. But if everyone uses the slate samples on every single record. <laughs> Every record sounds the same. How boring is that? It's maybe that's why people don't like music because everything's the same. Yeah, I think. Actually, I was going to ask you when you're adding samples in with your drums, if they're samples that you've recorded yourself, or if, and even if they're taken from the session that you've recorded those drums in, if you know what I mean, if it's a single hit from that session, or if they're completely from somewhere else. So I've 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 done it all where I've sampled drums that I've done, and then there's ones that I used. What I've realized is that if I have a snare drum and I feel like it needs more crack or, or more, more punch, if I just take mm. another snare drum that is that ex- same snare drum, I'm not going to get any more punch or snap because I already have that from my core snare drum. So that's where I look at a different sound. And yeah. I'm less – see, I'm, I'm not interested in replacing s- drums. I like to try to compress an EQ so that snare drum sounds good. But I'll use another let's, mm-hmm. a snare that maybe has more bottom end. That all of a sudden my cracky one will now have more weight to it, and I'll use it quieter, so I won't I won't overdo it. It'll just sound like that uh, that real one is just have meatier, or it needs more crack, so I'll use a more cracky one. And so I've learned that I've, I'll use other sources, and I have banks of stuff that I'll just I kind of know what I like, so I'll choose similar sounds. Um, but uh, yeah, I I don't. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of just sampling what I've done because I, I'm trying to correct a, a mistake, but I'm not correcting a mistake because it's the same sound. Yeah, makes perfect sense. I've got a few questions about drums, actually, since you're sort of like one of the dudes that gets really awesome drum sounds to start with. In terms of minimizing, I, I don't know that there is any magic bullets here, but in terms of minimizing the hi-hat spill into the snare mike do you have any secret tricks for dealing with that or that's that's <laughs> that's my biggest headache every single day like, seriously every day i have that headache um most drummers hit their hi-hat hard really hard and their snare drum i try to get people to hit their snare really hard as well but it just it always yeah. bleeds in um when i worked with pennywise fletcher the the first thing he said when he walked in the door when i was doing drums he goes why don't you have a shield between the I had and the snare drum? And I'm like, because I'm I put the mic closer and, and I'm not gonna get as much bleed through. Uh, you're gonna regret it, Cameron. You're you're gonna screw it all up. And later on the mix, <laughs> when I was trying to overly brighten it up, there there comes the hi hat, and you have to you you got to make choices then. And that's where sometimes you bring in a sample just to get the high end, so you don't have to brighten up your snare drum as far. Yeah. But um, it's you know what it's it's really in general, I mic pretty close to the snare. Um, a lot of some guys are up like whatever, uh, a couple inches. I'm kind of right on that thing, so I'm as close as I can kind of get. Um, 
So right. uh, I don't have a solution. There is no solution. The solution is finding a drummer that hits their snare drum harder. I mean, that's that's your ideal solution. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a tough one. And there's also gating things. There's, there's using gates and there's using side chains for like a snare drum. Like you'll have your snare drum firing and you take that same snare drum and you put it through a gate on another channel and you EQ some of that high end out. And so, so when that cracks, it's it's like a it's a it's a dual thing that's hitting and it's firing. And it's getting a little more crack. So it's just there's just tricks like that and compressing and ducking and elements like that. I think you're a fan of the drama gate more so than the stock digi design one or the Pro Tools one. Uh, I use the drama gate because it's the best gate that I've I've ever used. It's quick. It's fast. The, the digi one isn't quite as good. Um, it works every time. So. Uh, I love that gate. So you would definitely say it's superior to the standard Pro Tools one. Uh, it seems to be superior for me. I, I've it's been more consistent, and and it's also because I did come from when we used to use the hardware piece of gear, and I'd learned how to use that. So I mean, it, it's not yeah. that hard. Yeah. It's just using the threshold is all it really is. But uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think it probably sounds. It's just more consistent. I, I'm guessing. I don't know. It if regardless if you're if you tweak it a lot, you could probably get them to do this exact same thing, but I just know the ease of it. Mm. So, And to me, part of recording is if I know something works and it works for me really good, I'm going to keep using it because I don't have time to waste every single day trying to figure something out when I already had the solution sitting right next to me. So it, it's just as much as I love recording and yeah, and doing music, no, makes... I like to have a life totally. too. You know what I mean? I like to have fun and... I want to go home sometimes. I might want to go watch TV. I might want to go have a beer, whatever. Like, I don't want to... It's freaking boring. I mean, it's not boring. I love what I do. Don't get me wrong. But uh, it's boring when you're doing something that you just don't need to be doing, I, I'm going to say. So speaking of which, do you, you go and still... You still go out and see bands? Yeah. I'll, I'll go see bands. I saw saw Social Distortion on Sunday. I saw Corn in a band called Islander on... Uh, what day was that? But no. It was Tuesday and Sunday, so twice this week I went to. There's a new House of Blues that opened up, and uh, to me, it's it's supporting the people and the music that I love. Um, going to see Corn, the reason I went to Corn is because there's a band called Islander that was opening up, and I I've done two of their records, so I was just supporting that band and showing up and seeing how it sounded. But I'm also a Corn fan too, so it was cool to, to hang around backstage and run into them and have. Uh, the guitar player came up to me and was like, oh, I love this no effects record you did. And it, was, it just complimented me. I was like, whoa. Um, so, yeah, I'll go see music. I'll see it. I'll definitely will choose music based off of if I want to work with a band, I'll go check them out mm. and I'll see what they're all about live and hopefully try to meet them. Because that's how we kind of get our work. <clears throat> you don't get your work by just sitting around. Um, if they sh If they see that you're interested in them, then they're like, wow, that guy's all right. And he showed up. Sometimes just showing up gets you the job. Um, not always, but it helps get the job. So yeah, I'll go to music, but I'm selective. Um, and I want to see a good show. I don't want to see anything boring. So, and there's a lot of stuff that's kind of boring. So, yeah, oh, no doubt. Um, obviously, you wear earplugs when you go out to shows, though, right? Usually, not always the whole time, and it just depends on where I'm sitting. So, if it's not that loud, mm. I'll. I'll test it out, or maybe I'll start the show without it, and then I'll put them in. Um, so if it was like a Motorhead mm. show, I'll, I'll wear earplugs for sure. It's so loud. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. I try to protect myself. Am I am I an angel? No, but uh, if if I know it's too loud and it's gonna it's gonna start hurting me, then I'll put them in right away. I'll, I'll always have them with me, regardless. So yeah, you yeah. need to, you need to be safe when you're mixing. Are you conscious of looking after your hearing the best you can as well? Yeah, with that? I mean, do you? limit yourself to a certain amount of hours a day or something with actual mixing work or well with mixing what i'll do is i'll <clears throat> if for certain things I'll, I'll kind of turn it up louder and listening but i won't i won't leave it loud the whole time like i might try to get those drums cracking more it's more fun when it's a little bit louder and then once i start to bring the other elements in i'll start to get it more of a a, a more normal level where it's not super blazing so once it's like that, because yeah. here's the thing. If you listen loud all day long for, let's say, even three, two hours of loud music, you've kind of lost mm -hmm. your high end. Your high end is it 
it's thrown away. So now your mixing is, is going to be skewed from that point on. So if you turn up loud and listen, and then you find a normal level, <clears throat> you can listen for eight, 10 hours without it, you burning out. But here's the thing. Mentally, you get tired. After about eight hours of mixing, um, you're not making the same choice you made in hour one. So to me, um, I, won't, I won't make big drastic EQ changes um, at hour 10. I'll basically say, hey, you know what? I'm good for the night. I'll listen in the morning. And uh, yep. and if I do need to make that change, I'll make it the next morning. But yeah, I'll, I try to, you gotta be, you, you can only listen for so long. And also your patience. <clears throat> the longer you work, the less patience you get. And then you start to uh, get lazy. And then you, you, oh, I'm not gonna EQ that because <clears throat> I don't want to. But at hour <laughs> one, you'll be EQing it left and right and fixing it. So to me, the key to mixing is, and a lot of people don't do this, is it's just patience. And it's, it's, sometimes it takes time. You're not going to get a perfect mix in 10 minutes. Like It might take you three hours. It might take you six hours. It might take you an hour. It, it, it's, it's, it's all relative um, to what you want and what you're comparing it to and mm. what caliber of mix you want. Um, motorhead mixes didn't... Once I got one solid Motorhead one, one, one song, I could do another two three songs in a day um not finished but but pretty close to, to where i could bring it to the band but uh yeah well okay but the yeah. but the first one always took a while the first one takes <clears throat> anywhere from six to eight hours just to get it right and and then then you're yeah. second guessing it so then it's good for me for records like that where i have the budget i'll come back the next day and I, and then i'll fix it all within like an hour and it'll be done and then i can move on because because after a while you just you, like I said, you get tired. Your ears get tired, and they don't make as good of choices. Yep. But to me, if you want to be a good mixer, you can't be lazy. Yeah, you, yeah. You really have to want to do it, and you have to enjoy yeah. it. And and I love it. It's it's so much fun to me to sit by myself and EQ this drum or whatever, and get the whole mix going, and then and then look at it and say, what one thing could I do to make this mix better? Is it a delay? Could I compress something? Could I mess something up? And to me, that's where the magic of a mix comes out because then it like brings a song to life and it might be this little throw or whatever it is, but it's that kind of stuff that makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. So jumping all over the place here, when you're recording drums, do you do the tuning yourself or do you always use a drum tech? Um, I used to use drum techs all the time, but the budgets have gotten smaller and smaller. Mm. And I was, there's a point where, I was using a drum tech or two that was getting paid more money than I was getting paid. And I was and I thought about it. I said, that's interesting. <laughs> okay. But I still got to pay them. So I would pay them. Um, th they were great drum techs, awesome drum techs. Um, over the years, I've learned a lot. I, and I would sit with those drum techs, and I would talk to them, and they would teach me things. And um, if I have a bigger budget, I'll bring a drum tech in, no problem. If I have a smaller budget... I won't, and I'll ask the drummer. They'll say, hey, are you good with your drums or not? And if they say they're not, then I'll have to judge whether um, my skill is good enough, too. And, and I'm pretty good at it. Now that I've done it so many times, um, I'm not going to be as good as that mm. drum tech, but I might get something unique. I might get something different than them, and that, that's cool. Um, the biggest things about drum techs that's really important is if you have a big session – and there's a lot of money, and there's not a lot of time. A drum tech not only tunes the drums, but he fixes the drums as they're going on, or he 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 can watch the drums. So you're never gonna have downtime with it with with a guy like that because in between each take, he's running out there, he's tweaking things, he's seeing that a lug's falling out, and he's gonna fix that lug. So if you're at a big session, all of a sudden the snare drum breaks. Mm. At the producer, me, I have to walk in the room, and I gotta do this thing when maybe I should be working on the songs when it's a big caliber when it's a smaller thing there's less money and there's more time so the smaller things you don't worry so much hey why don't you guys go take five we're gonna work on the snare drum for a minute so um, I prefer to have a drum tech I can't usually uh, my budgets usually don't have the money for it anymore um, not, not that they don't sometimes they do but not always Motorhead they did I was lucky yeah yeah, I haven't had a proper listen through good headphones or monitors yet, but all the drums that I heard in the electricity multi-tracks, 
there's no sort of pings and rings and all those extraneous sort of harmonics that you usually get <laughs> in snare drums when they're not sort of dealt with properly. Yeah. So it seems like that's something you are working to eliminate before you are miking up. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a record too. We had this guy named Tim who did that. And every day he put a new snare head on first thing in the morning, he, unless... Unless he would come to me first and say, hey, that snare looks brand new, Cameron. Did you work much? And I'll be like, yeah, we did. Replace it. So we would replace those for that record specifically. And um, he liked, Mickey D likes a certain sound, and he likes it kind of deep. Um, so when it's deep like that, we put a little bit of tape or gel or whatever on that snare drum because we don't want the rings, and we don't want the, uh, the, ch the, yeah. the cheapness. Now, some records sound cool when their snare is a little wonky or a little ringy. Like sometimes... That brings in energy that when you listen to electricity, yeah, that's a very safe drum sound. That's that snare drum is a very, <laughs> it's it's dead. It's it, it's it cracks really good. It's really wide and it's full, but it's not uh, it's not like a reckless sort of snare sound. And but that's that's what we we chose. Yeah. It's really controlled, yeah. Yeah, on purpose. It was like that on purpose. Yeah, in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but not yeah. every record should be that way. Not every and not everything I do should be that like that either. Um, but I'm I, yeah. I'm a big um, I'm big into new heads. I love because when a drummer comes to me and he's got an old head that he's had on for a year, it doesn't have the same life that a brand new head has on it. And I'll almost always whether I'll pull it out of my closet and say, "Hey, just here, use mine. I, you don't have any money? Fine, just use this one." Or I'll, or we'll go to Guitar Center and get new heads because if someone wants a really good sounding drum sound to represent their drums, you got to have new heads. Otherwise, it's just it, there'll be rings, there'll be pongs, there'll be flops, there'll be just all sorts of weird stuff. Yeah, and then if you are trying to deal with that, like once it's recorded, you have to do all sorts of jumping through hoops of like surgical EQ and all that sort of messing around to fix it, I suppose. And then, but see what you're, but but you're going back to what we first talked about. How my style is to get it right the first time because you know it yeah. sucks. The worst about what you just said is. If I have a snare drum that has all these rings and pongs that you don't want while you're trying to mix, I have to EQ all that stuff out, and I have to not make the snare drum I want to make. I got to make this weird Frankenstein-sounding snare drum just to get it to work, so I'll never get the vision that I'm shooting for. So I should have been paying attention. As, as an engineer, you kind of you failed. If if you get that and you didn't know you were getting that, then you failed. Unless it's one of those situations where something was so magical and it just worked. And then when you look at it later, like, oh, that's not as good as it could be. But maybe all the other mics covered it, so it's fine. So maybe that's a situation where you don't solo that snare drum all the time. I worked one time when I was an assistant at Larrabee. Rancid came in, and they were mixing a single for a record. I think the song is called Blood Clot. And yep. uh, a guy named Tim Palmer was mixing it. And he puts up the snare drum mic. And he goes, Cameron, listen to this snare drum mic. And I'm like, it sounds like a room mic. And he goes, yeah, it does. He goes, what's wrong? So we called up uh, the producer, and I think it was Jerry Finn. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, we love that take. But the snare drum mic fell on the ground. But the take was so good that we just kept the take. And Tim looked at me, and I looked at him, and we're like, okay, now what do we do? And I think on that song, I laid in a sample for him. And I just had to like figure out wherever those wherever those hits were, and I would put a sample there just to help him get more of a snap to the snare. But it's a situation where you're like, it was a moment in time, and that's what they captured. And is it perfect? I don't know. When I listen to that record, I don't complain about the snare. I think there was so much energy in what that band did that it sounded great. So to me, no one would have known if, if I hadn't pointed that out or if Tim hadn't talked about it. Yeah, you wouldn't know. Absolutely, wouldn't care. no. That's and I'm sure. And you know what's funny is, you take a situation like that. That's a huge punk rock band, and you take kids now that a kid might complain and be like, "Well, you're not very good at what you do because you let that thing fall on the ground and you didn't have them do another take." And it's like, that's that's not the point of recording. Sometimes it's not always about this perfection. Sometimes it's more about mm -hmm. a feeling and a passion and an emotion that you capture that. We, we take out a lot because we overly edit, we overly criticize our own work. And it's mm -hmm. there's some records I do where if, if I know a guitar player wants to overly criticize everything, 
I'm going to be really anal and very specific on things. If I know someone's going to allow freedom, I love those. Those sessions are way more fun because you're like, you know what? That thing's a little out of tune, but it sounds cool. And you look at each other and you say, done, move on. What? Let's not waste any time. So it's just as much as we want to make recordings perfect, like we also want to be alive and like enjoy just things and enjoy sounds and if if everything sounds the same what's the point of listening to it so um and i think that's the charm of different producers and different mixers and different people doing stuff like uh that's why there's i listen to a lot of different producers and mixers and i enjoy their sounds and i might not do what they do but i appreciate what they do yeah totally totally like I said, I, my ideas have sort of been sculpted from the same kind of ideas, so I totally agree, which mm-hmm. is why I wanted to talk to you okay. in the first place, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, good. I, I suppose because I started out having to record on four tracks and that sort of thing. So coming from a time before Pro Tools, I think, is makes you more in touch with understanding the performances where it it starts. And uh, that's well, it, well, back then you had to... You had to play it in one take, and you had to try to play it as well as you could. So it created more of an awareness of of that, I suppose. Yeah, and if you think yeah. about those players that were playing those things, whether it was heavy records or going back to like Sweet Home Alabama or whatever, those people played mm. that. That's just what they did that day. And some of that stuff, it's so perfect, and you listen to that. And and nowadays, you have a, a kid that comes in that can't hold time or rushes and speeds up. It's like, this is why you are not that band. This is why you won't be that band until you rehearse a ton more and get to that level. And those people were at very high levels. And nowadays, you can be n- not at a high level and still get make a good recording because you can because we can be sneaky and we can do that. And but there's, I just so I just did that this project we were talking about where it's a guy named mm. Chris from Strung Out. He's the guitar. He's the bass player strung out but he's playing guitar and he's singing and we have the guy from Hooba Stink, Jesse playing bass and then we have this guy Sean Winchester playing drums and he was an incredible session drum player he came in uh, and he hit hard every take and when I had new ideas he would do those ideas and he'd do them right and when I mixed it just recently I was excited I was like this reminds me of like the Foo Fighters, the color and the shape, the energy of those drums, the the power of a good player playing drums and hitting a drum correctly. It's like the snare drums yeah. you hit, every hit was hard. So I didn't have a ton of, of, of hi-hats that were getting in my way. Like it, And it was exciting to mix that because I was like, this is almost mixing itself. Mickey D was similar to that. There's, I've worked yeah. with tons of other great drummers. Josh Freeze or even Eric Sandin's a great drummer from No Effects. Like... All these people, they're they've done it a lot. They do it every day, and they're good at what they do. And they came from a time when that was the only way to get a good recording down. Yeah, I guess so. You listen to a guy like Eric Sandin uh, for No Effects. He kind of created that fast beat. Do da do da da do da. He was yep. the creator of that. If you think back at Punk and Drublick or those early records, there was no Pro Tools or nonsense. That's what he did. And to have that consistency on a kick drum is, I'm not saying it's impossible, like guys can do it, obviously he did it, but I'll give you 10 other guys that are good drummers that try to play his beat that won't sound a tenth as good as what he does. And and when he comes in the studio and he does it for you, it's exciting because I, I smile and I go, I don't even need a trigger on that thing because he just, that's what he is and what he's done and there's an excitement to that and and I respect that in him and in, in what he does, for sure. Totally awesome. Uh, um, so just to touch a bit more on pre-production, I'm guessing the scope of what you would do for different bands is probably pretty radically different in, in terms of uh, what would come under the banner of pre-production. Um, is it correct? I think you did pre-production on the last Megadeth album, is that right? I did, yeah, I did. Um, so what did you have to do for that? So, okay, so most pre-production I do is not that different. Uh, for a record with okay. a guy like Dave Dave Mustaine, that was a different situation because Dave came in, he said, I've got these riffs, I've got 400 riffs. Will you listen to him, Cameron? And I said, yeah, but that's a lot of riffs. And it was, I mean, I had like six hours of riffs that I would just take in the car and I'd listen to. But 
what he would do is he'd come in and he'd take a riff and he'd play it or we would take the recording of it and we'd listen to it and then he'd find another riff that he liked that would go along with that and we would kind of put riffs together and part of the pre-production, he would do something and if I looked at him, I was like, I don't know about that, Dave. He usually felt the same thing, but it was a reinforcement that, of what was right and wrong. So for us, it it was a fun collaboration where he would just... and. He, he has great riffs, and he's always written great riffs. And one of the funny things is, at one point, we were, I was listening to a bunch of riffs. I'm like, this kind of sounds like Metallica. And I go, wait, no wonder it sounds like Metallica, because he was in Metallica. I'm like, okay, that's just what his arms do. There wasn't like him trying to be. That's just the nature of what he was. But So that's a situation where we did some pre-production on and off for a couple weeks, and then... Uh, they ended up doing a record uh, out of town, and I wasn't able to work on that record, the rest of it. But um, for most bands, big or small... Oh, okay. Most bands, yeah. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, so if you'd been available, you would have probably done the engineering or stuff for it? or If he hadn't moved to Nashville, I probably would have uh, engineered, or, well, I'm, uh, engineered or co-produced. I don't know. Um, but he moved to Nashville. I introduced him to an engineer who ended up co-producing it with him. So he basically took over what I was doing, but I wasn't able to go out there at the time, and and he was happy with with what happened. So I didn't end up finishing that record. But uh, but in general, like yeah. for pre production, it's not that different. When a band comes to me and they say, "Hey, we want to record next week," uh, first thing I'll say is, "Well, send me the songs," and if they if they don't have the songs recorded, then I'll say, "Okay, why don't you guys rehearse tomorrow and put it on an iPhone and, and give it to me." And the reason why I do that is because nine times out of ten, they don't have the songs. They don't. The drummer doesn't know how to play it. The bass player doesn't know how to play it. They don't have what they say they're going to have in a week. And I know that if they show up in the studio and they're not prepared, we're wasting their money, my time, and their time, and we're going to get a crappy product. So for me, I just call it out. I just say, hey, and when it's a bit, most bands. If they're seasoned, they know, hey, we need to do some pre-production. We need to do some rehearsals. And I'll go into those rehearsals with those guys. And but what I like them to do is 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 work as a band first. Like, work as a band. Get your songs as good as you can get them. And then bring it to me. Because I don't want to influence too soon with a lot of people. Because I want them to be artists. And then I want to come in and say, why aren't? where's the chorus? Where's the verse? Or why is this part here? It makes no sense. Like, why is it, why are you repeating this for three minutes? Like we need to, <laughs> we need to chop stuff down. And the stuff I say to them is usually pretty logical. And most people will look at it and say, you know what? You're right. Why didn't I think of that? And it's just cause you're different when you're holding an instrument. It's different than if you're, uh, uh, if you're, if you're watching an instrument be, be played. So to me, pre-production is so it's the most important part of a record. Um, because you're not going to get – getting magic is really difficult if you don't come in with a good idea and you're just guessing later on. It's just like fixing in the mix. It's it's never a good idea. Yeah, right. So that's actually like pretty involved in uh, the musical side of it. It's not just sort of making sure they've got all their instruments sorted out and it's actually – it's no. <laughs> sort of working at the musical level. I'm not I'm not sure who I was working with, but some, some kid came in to me one day and – he said, hey, I want to record this song. And I said the same thing, like, hey, um, give me some tapes and let me come to rehearsal. And then he looked at me and he goes, "Yeah, oh, so you're a real producer then. And I was like, what? What do you mean? He goes, well, you're like an old school real producer where you start from the beginning and you and you want to get it done. Not like, and I don't want to talk shit about like someone who's just starting, but a lot of kids start and they think they're immediately a producer and they don't even know how to produce or engineer yet. And they and they they promote themselves as a producer, but they don't they haven't learned they haven't experienced enough and they need to experience more and uh, and they'll they'll walk in with that band never even hearing the song that they're going to record and then they'll realize that the band didn't write a song so then the whole whole recording session is trying to organize a song uh, before you even record like you're in the middle of recording it and you don't have a song yet so then it's like you're building a song so it's like. I don't, I don't like that side of things because uh, studios cost money and it, it it costs everyone money and you're gonna get a better product. Let, let's let's here's an example. A band comes in, doesn't have a song at all. They will walk in the door 
it's going to take a day to work out a song and write a song. If a band comes in prepared, that first day you'll get all the drums done. You might even get some bass, maybe some guitars. You'll get a big chunk of the song done. Day two, you can walk out the door with a polished product. Day two on an unprepared song, you're still writing the song. And you're day three, four, who knows how many days you end up doing. And by the end, it's very rare that you have a better product than um, or, or a band that's happier than, uh, than, that, than that one when they come in prepared. So just experience. Yeah, so a lot of the work can and should be done before you hit the studio, in other words, it's obviously. But as in the music side of it, I mean, yeah, that seems pretty uh, logical. <laughs> it's, I mean, if you want to save time and money, that's the way you do it. If, if you have endless money, don't write anything and come to the studio. That's, that's great if, if you have those abilities, which most people don't. If you're a bigger artist and you're used to doing that, that's kind of a different situation. Like Because if you have the luxury to spend time and money uh, and that's the way you do it, then that's fine. But I'm just saying like a kid that says, I got 500 bucks, um, I want to sound like Green Day and I haven't written a song yet. You're not... (laughs) I, I can't help you. Like, I mean, yeah, I can record some drums and this and that, but you, it, we're not going to get that caliber of a recording uh, that fast. Usually. Usually. Yeah. Not saying it's not possible, because it is possible. <laughs> it, it really seems to me like that whole thing of a band hitting the studio without their stuff written yet, it seems like a real thing of the past, like a real, like the distant past. But so moving on from that, then the future of it all, the future of engineering and mixing bands producers and all that sort of thing obviously you've seen things change coming from where you started and then uh, i imagine like where the majority of your career has been and then things changing more and more so what do you think about the future of it all in terms of being a producer or an engineer uh you know what i I honestly i wish i could predict the future and i knew it's it's kind of it's scary um because when i had a kid call me the other day and said i want to do what you do, and I did. I didn't have a, a path to mm. send them in. I I didn't like. I went to a big studio when big studios existed, and and then I worked my way up, and then I ended up collecting gear, and I ended up putting it into a studio. And um, the future, it's kind of scary because uh, the the problem is. I, I look at the problem is this. It's 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 phones, and what people do, they have this phone that. They can be contacted at every moment. And it used to be, let's just say in the 90s, you used to hop in your car yeah. and you'd listen to an album if you drove for two hours. And you listen to that record twice over that period of time. Now you hop in your car, you turn yep. on the radio, you get a minute in and you get a phone call and you talk for, for two hours. So you don't listen to the music the same. Or <laughs> maybe you make 10 <laughs> phone calls and you get you get four songs in at the, at the same time where you would have gotten two albums in. So... It's not that people mm. don't like music. People still like music, but they're just there's so many more distractions. There's games. There's um, it's not what it listening to music is not the same as it was. And people don't listen to like they wouldn't buy a Metallica record and listen to it top to bottom. It, I think it's I don't know anyone that could go forty minutes without getting a phone call, important or not important kind of person. There's just something that that cuts mm. you off and. Uh, there was a charm to that that you would get into this mood and uh, and now you listen to a couple songs and then you jump to another band and then another band so people are becoming more scattered in their listening and good or bad it's just different I mean uh, and you take one thing that annoys me is <clears throat> is notifications so you have say you want to go on Amazon and you're listening to a song well you might get a notification oh do you want to hear this kind of song and all of a sudden there's another song that pops in as opposed to like, hey, I just want to listen mm. to something for an hour without any interruptions at all. And it's it doesn't exist. If you're on your laptop, there's always, oh, you're getting a new email, you're getting a text, you're getting a phone call, like it pops in. So I just switched off all the notifications and everything. Like I should have actually turned my phone off, but like I actually switched all that stuff off before we started because yeah, it's inevitable someone's going to be in touch or well, something's going to come up that's just crap anyway. Or Yeah. Yeah. And nine times out of 10, those notifications are not important. It's it's very rare when it's an exactly. extreme emergency. Like, And I'll have kids, when I'm recording them, I'll have a guy playing guitar in front of me, and he'll be looking at his phone, and I'll say, 
really? Do you have to look at your phone right now? And I'll flip it upside down. And then right after his take, he'll flip it back over. Mm. And I'll say, why are you checking that? Well, my sister called. Okay. Is she okay? I don't know. I didn't check. Well, does she have like health issues or something? <laughs> oh, and, he, and then he said to me, what if she got in a car crash? She called me twice. And then I said, okay, maybe you should call her. Here's, here's what happened. He picks up the phone, talks to his sister. His sister starts bitching him out about how you didn't pick up the phone. I'm so mad at you. And, and he's like, why were you originally calling me? Oh, I wanted to call, make sure you fed the cat. And I'm like, but now you're yelling at me and you're rude to me. So he hangs up the phone. Now he sits with me and he's in a grumpy mood. And I look at him and I go, why did you just pick up your phone? And he says the same thing to me. And I said, go put it in that hat in the corner. Like, go hide it. Because the reality is emergencies don't happen that often. And there's not a lot you can do if you're 10 hours away or whatever it is. Like, nothing that usually can't be solved two hours later. It is a scary thing that people feel, they would feel actually uncomfortable literally switching their phone off and putting it in the corner for 12 hours. It's like it's, or even eight hours. It's like it's such a long time to not be, you know, doing the, <laughs> um, being attached to it, you know? It's absurd. It's, yeah, that, that it's, is, it is crazy. I read, I read a rad article um, about Mark Mothersbra of Devo and they were talking about phones and he said, and it, I don't, I'm not sure if he said this or it was part of the article, but it was healthy for people to, uh, check your emails in the morning and your phone. And then if you start to work, like, so, let's say you work at nine, take your phone and turn it off. And then at noon, at your lunchtime, then you check all your messages and whatever it is. It it alleviates stress because if you have it on, it's kind of sitting there and you're getting a text and you're looking at it on your, and you get, you're getting distracted. You're not focusing. Like a guy like Mark Mothersbra, he's writing songs and he's he's working on TV shows. And it's like, there needs to be, focus and there needs to be not a scattered brain happening and to me i do that mm. all the time i get yelled at by my wife all the time why aren't you texting me it's like <laughs> i literally turned my phone off because i was mixing and i wanted to get into that music so much that i didn't want the world to exist that was the world to me and i do that all the time i mean every day i do that and my and a lot of times my phone will be in the front room and i won't even know it and then lunchtime comes around i'm like oh wow i, I probably should check my messages so it's just, you know, you're going to, people are going to live how they want to though. Like I can't, as much as I, with, with bands, a lot of times I've said, Hey, everyone put your phone in a hat and then we'll check it later. No, they won't do it. I might get one or two guys for maybe an hour. And then the other guys will, nah, I gotta, I gotta look at it. Okay. Whatever. Look at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. That's it. I think if you're old enough to remember the time before mobile phones, um, you can recognize it as being a, like people have become neurotic with their level of attachment and constant engagement with it. It is actually a bit scary Yeah. when you remember before that time. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. But um, in I terms mean, of... I don't, uh, don't want to harp on a little bit, but yeah, um, w when you're a producer or an, or an engineer, your job is to capture someone playing something, something, someone doing something. And the hardest thing about what we do is like, say I'm, yeah. I'm tracking drums and the rest of the band's in the room and we're all sitting there and three of the guys on the couch are looking at their phones the whole time. And while I'll ask them a question, I'll say, how was that take? Were all the fills good? And all the guys will look at me and they'll say, yeah. And then two days later, they'll say, dude, Cameron, what's with all those fills in that song? Why are the drums like that? And I'll say to them, I'll be like, remember when you guys all sat on your phone and I asked you and you said everything was cool? And it's And they look at you like, well, how do we fix it now? And I said, well, there's no drums in the studio anymore. There is no way to fix it. Maybe you should have paid attention two days ago. And it's it's that side of things because we're uh, there's only so much resistance you can give someone because you have to give them a product they want. But sometimes I'm yelling at people like, I need you to listen because I need you to know what we're doing. I need you to know where this end thing is going to be. We got to focus. Like, we really need to focus. And, um, and the people that really take it seriously, they focus. They'll put it down and they're like, okay, you know what? Let's play it again, and and I'll play it. Okay, we need to fix these five things. So you know, to me, it's just more or less like you don't want to do things twice, and a lot of times you do things twice when people aren't paying attention. Um, out of curiosity, did Lemmy own a mobile phone? <laughs> yeah. Did Did Lemmy own a mobile phone? He did. Phone? Yeah, he did. He used to have a flip top phone forever, for the first yeah right friggin' <laughs> ten years I knew him. Maybe the last. 
four years, I think he got an iPhone. Uh, he loved it. And then he got an iPad. And the iPad sucked because he used to tell stories all day long. And now, towards the end, he would show up with the iPad. And then all of a sudden, he'd want to play games the whole time. And I'd be like, no, put that thing away. Come on. Like, if you want, go to the rainbow and play your, your games. Like, I either want to hear stories or I want to hear you work. And he was pretty good. But, and I would mm. give him his time. I mean, he. He's a grown man. He did what he wanted to do. Um, but, yeah, he did own phones. Yep. So um, while I'm thinking of it, actually, I know you mixed all the live Motorhead stuff. Yep. Um, so did you ever have to fix any of that in terms of the timing or the tuning of it? Or did you always just let it be just let it be live the whole time wait, if wait. it's not a secret? <laughs> well, no, no. Uh, um, live recording is a live recording. Um, mistakes happen. Things happen. Uh, snare drums ring. It it is what it is. Microphones get knocked. It it's. I would mix those things, uh, like there was no options in the world. Like I would just compress and EQ, and do volume rides. I wouldn't say so. When I did, uh, yep. the first live Motorhead, one I did, I think Lemmy came in and he wanted to redo a couple of lines of vocals, um, on. Like one or two songs. He forgot the lyrics or something, or he fell off the mic. So that record, there might have been a couple overdubs, but all the rest of them, it's just, to me, you're capturing a moment in time. And yeah, it's not perfect, but that perfect person's not perfect mm. either. So I did, it wasn't Motorhead, but I did a, a live recording for another band. I'm not going to mention the name. They'll know who they are if um, <laughs> if they, uh, <coughs> Zebra Head, if, if they listen to this ever, which they won't. But uh, they... Uh, <laughs> You, you'd we never recorded, know that. <laughs> we recorded this full thing, full thing, and it was, it was actually my wife's. It was our anniversary, so I was like bummed that I was there, but I'm like, no, I'm gonna record this for him. And they got it, and they said, hey, we want to do some overdubs. And I said, guys, it's okay. Like it, the show was great. Let's just keep it up. Well, we'll do it on our own. We'll do it at our own studio. I said, go ahead, do it at your own studio, and then give me the the final product you wanted to mix. They redid every bass, every guitar, every vocal. The only thing they kept was the drums. And then what they did is they redid all that stuff, 100%, and then they put the video on it, and they came to me and they said, why isn't anything lined up? Like, why is it all... I'm like, come on, guys. Seriously, you know why it's not lined up. You redid every single thing. And they're like, well, let's add a tune. Yeah. And I said, uh, yeah. no, it was, it was totally fine, and it was cool, and it was energetic, and it was... Uh, and it was great, and they ended up throwing it away. They never released it because they they'd overdid it. And um, another one, let me give you another quick one. Another band I worked with, they <laughs> the bass player came to me and said, I'm, "My bass is a little bit out of tune. Let's tune the bass on the whole thing." And I said, "Okay, we can tune the bass, but here's the problem: the singer was singing to an out of tune bass, so he's going to sing out of tune." Now, if we tune the bass, mm -hmm. the bass is going to be out of tune, and the singer is going to be out of tune. And he didn't get that, and he he made me tune the bass. And can you tell? You can't tell that the bass is in tune. You just I know something's not right in the whole organicness of it and the the sonics of it. I didn't think it sounded as mm. good. And in the end, it was his band, his deal. We I did what they asked. Um, I it wasn't right. I didn't think it was right. So. But in general, yeah. I think live should be treated as live, and if it's not good enough, then don't release it. Uh, to I, I absolutely, I totally believe the same thing, hundred percent. In fact, I like to hear mistakes on live albums. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so even um, the very last one where Lemmy wasn't that well, I was curious as to whether any of that had to get fixed up in terms of the vocal timing or the parts or whatever but all that was just straight out live as well is that right straight out live i didn't i didn't change any timing didn't tune anything uh, uh i might have reinforced the kick drum with the sample just to add a little more weight to it but i didn't touch yeah. the toms i don't think i touched the snare either um i just there there were two shows um from that uh, it's called clean your clock so that was the friday night show that yep. i mixed yep. i mixed the saturday night show as well the problem was the Saturday night show wasn't as good. And it the reason why it wasn't as good is so Lemmy likes to have the snare drum in his wedge really loud. So it's bass, snare drum, and vocals is all he has in his wedge. The second night, he had yep. the wedge so loud 
that when you would hear him sing on the on the mic, the snare drum and it was it wasn't you could hear the snare drum louder than the lead vocal. But it wasn't a good snare drum. It had been brightened up so much that it was a really harsh, piercing <laughs> snare. So when I tried to mix it, you couldn't hear his vocals. And that's the reason why we chose the first night. Because the first night was okay. The monitors were fine. But the second night, like yep. even me using compressors to duck it and all these things, it's I, I gave yep. it to label and I'm like, guys, I this is as good as it I can do with this. I mean... It just doesn't sound great, and and I think the first night probably they played a little bit better as well. So, but mm. yeah, sometimes you just they in a sense they're throwing it away, or just maybe they'll release it years down the road. I don't know. Yeah. So if someone was really determined in two thousand seventeen and onwards to be a producer or audio engineer or just like want to focus on being a mixing engineer or whatever, anything along those lines. I think you've sort of highlighted that trying to go down the track of emptying the garbage and making coffee for a studio is probably not probably going to be the track to get you there these days. But like if one of your kids came to you and said that's what they wanted to do, would yeah. you have any golden yeah. advice? You know what? I, I would say just understand that it's a lot of work. And if, if you don't love it to death, then... There's no way you should do it. You should walk away right now because I enjoy it. I like compressors. I like EQs. I like uh, I like the sonics of, of doing things. I enjoy it. When I go home, I'll listen to the, the, the radio all the way home to, to try to improve what I'm doing. I might go home. I might even work a little bit. Um, if I had a day job and I didn't do this anymore, I'd probably do it at night. And that's not <laughs> – I mean that means mm. I, I shouldn't quit. Um what would I tell people to do is like, you know what, find a focus. Like if you want to be a mixer, then start listening and, 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 and understanding what mixes are and then and, and read and go to YouTube, talk to people, not just YouTube, but maybe talk to a mixer or try to uh, get involved with them and um, go to a studio. I, I, I get leery when people say, I'll just start working at the local studio down the street. And there's a good and bad about that. If it's a local studio and they don't have much knowledge then it it'll tell you keep you a couple basics but it won't give you really good engineering skills so if you can find someone who's more experienced it's maybe good to to learn and from those people in the beginning you get whatever you can if you can get in a studio you get in that studio and you you learn and you figure it out and and you learn maybe don't be so scattered like try to become a good engineer a good mixer um being a producer that takes time. That takes time of dealing with people, learning people, realizing what is a good sound, what is a good engineering sound. Um, and if, you, if you're not a good engineer, realize that as a producer, you better hire a, a good engineer to do your work. Um, that's that's as, as important as all this stuff, is like knowing where your limitations are and um, a lot of hard work. I mean, I've had a lot of good times, but I've also had, I mean... I spend a lot of time doing this every day, and uh, it's it's because I like doing it, and that's it. So it's just there's no one way. Uh, get get Pro Tools, learn Pro Tools, figure it out, try different samples out, and experiment and and compare and realize why. And the biggest thing is take whatever you're recording and then put up whatever's current, whether it's Green Day or Metallica, and say, "Wow, why doesn't mine sound as good as this?" and and try to figure it out and just learn it's your ears take time um it takes five years before your ears really start to be able to like hone in on things and people say well no i could learn right away it's like you don't though like i didn't hear for two years the way i i mean i didn't hear for like five years the way i hear now at all like i can pick out anything in a mix very specific and that's what that's just from re repetition every single day soloing unsoloing listening and and trying to match things uh, uh, every every single day. So no one way. And just, I mean, if you want to be a songwriter, then write songs. If you want to be uh, an engineer, then yep. plug in microphones and, and do it. That's the only way you're really going to learn. Just doing. Yep. And if you still have, if you have that level of commitment and passion and desire, there's still a, an opening for you to forge a career and make money, right? Yeah. And having a career and making money is... It's, I mean, that's the goal is to, to, it's why 
when I played bass guitar, it's why I said, hey, I'm not making any money at bass guitar. I've never made money. I made a couple hundred dollars in 10 years. Maybe there's another job in music that I could do. And that's when I started to learn the engineering and producing. And because I saw that those people were actually making a living doing this. And it's a really competitive industry. Like, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm just saying it's one of the most because that's just what I'm involved with. But there's a lot of people that are learning that, that can take your job. And there's a lot of people that are really big that don't have a lot of work that, that are going to take your job. So it's like there's all these it, – it's not easy, and you just have to um, – you find your niches. And even though my niche is in the heavy and the punk rock world, uh, I learned working on pop and rap and, like, uh, and rock and all these things to where if you put me in the room with any artist in the world, I can record vocals or record the instruments – where if you took someone who's inexperienced, you couldn't put them in the room with a Justin Bieber. They would they would mess up. Yeah, they can plug in a microphone, but they might distort it, or they might not uh, know how to, to cater to him and to cater to, to his sound or whatever it is. And like that's one thing I pride myself in is I've sat in the room yeah. with Michael Jackson. I've sat in the room with Dr. Dre. I've s sat with Lemmy or with Fat Mike or uh, uh, I, I mean the list goes on. Madonna, all these people. And I've watched and I learned and I learned that just there at such a high level, you need to respect that level. And the work that you need to show them needs to be equal to that level if you really want to give them a good product. Because if you're way below them, then you're doing them a disservice um, doing work for them. So, And yeah, you take your risks, but uh, be smart about the risks you take. And you, you want to you wanna work with that person so they come back and say, wow. You're great. I want to work with you again, and that's like the, that's the biggest compliment we ever get is is someone calling you back. Let me call me back eight, ten times. That was a huge compliment. He'd worked with the big, biggest producers in the world, and he kept choosing me. And I, I mean, yeah, I don't take that lightly. I took it, but I also was very professional with the way I, I did things. You know what I mean? When it came to the work aspect with him, and with everyone, everyone I, I deal with. Yeah. So. I always have that mic ready and tested. Yeah. It must have been pretty surreal being in the room with Michael Jackson. <laughs> Check this out. So uh, the music director, he showed up first, and he was there a couple hours before, and he said, here's the deal, Cameron. Here's how this works. You're an assistant. I have the engineer. When Michael comes in to sing, you're going to meet him. We'll talk for a little bit. But when he goes in the vocal booth, he usually kicks everyone out in the studio except for the engineer and myself. And what he'll do is he'll give me like a look. And, and if he gives me a look, then I'm going to ask you to leave. Don't, don't complain. Don't say anything. Just walk and sit outside the door. So if we need you, we're going to call you back in. And I sat there. We, we shook hands. I met Michael. We talked a little bit. We listened to the track. And uh, he walked in the, in the vocal booth and, to get ready to sing. And I look at the musical director, and he looks at me, and he goes, guess you're cool. And I sat there, and, and he, he tracked for, whatever, half an hour and uh, because he trusted me. As, me as a person, he saw that I was okay. You know what I mean? He, he, didn't, he, he knew that I wasn't going to be a problem or he, he wasn't going to be nervous around me. And that's part of what we do. Like if he'd walked in the room and I was some creepy guy and I was weird and just being a freak, he would have asked me to leave. But <laughs> we, we yeah. can't be that guy. Like you got to – you got to be a human being, and, and you you have to make people comfortable um, everywhere you go. Um, and that's just – in life, an uncomfortable person is going to be uncomfortable everywhere. That's probably not a good producer or engineer. Yeah. I think my biggest plus is that I'm kind of a quiet – I'm a shy person. So if I go to a party, I'm not going to reach out and talk to a bunch of strangers. Chances are if they come to me, I'll talk to them and I'll be friendly. But if I don't – like. This conversation with you is easy because you're talking about things or we're talking about things that I really enjoy, that I, I like talking about. I like, like I said, music and equipment, and it's what I talk about and deal with every day. So to me, it's really fun. But you put me in yeah. you put me in a strange place, I'm probably going to just hang out in the corner and, and not say a whole lot. And um, But the, the plus of that is maybe that's a good social trait for me because if someone comes in – they're performing. They're singing. They need someone to listen and pay attention. Well, I'm that person because I don't need to hear myself talk. Obviously, we've been talking for an hour or whatever, but in general, I would rather just sit and listen to that person and focus. So when they do that first take, I'm listening and going, wow, that's 
an amazing take or you know what you missed these three little parts can we redo that and they'll appreciate that because we don't have to sit and listen to the mistake and then redo it because from moment one i'm focused on them i'm not focused on myself and that's like that's the biggest trait is not being it's not being selfish a selfish person is not going to be a good engineer or a good producer i think <laughs> at least from my experience yeah Oh, absolutely. No, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. So is there, I know you've got like a fair collection of nice gear in your studio, but is there is there like a dream piece of gear that you don't have yet that you would love to have? You know what? I have, the, the equipment that I have is all necessity equipment. I don't really have luxury equipment because I, the kinds of records I do don't always, you don't make a ton of money off of, of those records. Um, the dream it's to have like, uh, like what Dave Grohl has. He has that Sound City uh, Neve 1081 yeah. or 1073 console. That would be a dream mm-hmm. to have a 24 channel or 32 channel of of that. Like that, sonically, like those. That's the sound I love. That's a lo- what I love to hear. And when I have the budget, I'll go to NRG or Grandmaster or or I went to Dave Grohl's studio and we tracked there just recently because I love the core of that sound and the fullness. So to me. Like that would be my dream piece of equipment to have, and um, it, it's just it's fun. You, you literally turn those knobs and you move things, and it, it there's life. There's life within that. It like it like breathes. Um, and for a while, I had an API at the studio, and it was very similar to something like that. But you know, th- those Neves are pretty special. And so I'm guessing that means you're also if it comes down to a shootout between mixing or like summing in the analog domain or doing it in the box. I know so many people have varying opinions about all that, but do you have an opinion about that? Uh, right now, I'm mixing almost all in the box. Um, if I had a choice, I would mix um, I would mix onto consoles, but that choice has been taken away from me because everyone wants to recall things. Everyone wants to fix things. And they don't just want to fix it that that day. They want to fix it a week later or two weeks later. And if I'm not all in the box on those records, I have to tell them no. And if you tell them no, then you get fired. So uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it's it's forced us to be in there. Um, can we do good work? Yeah, we can do good work in the box. We can make. I can make. I can make a. I recorded a song for a band called Trapped or mixed. I mixed a song for a band called Trapped and. Yeah. Uh, just recently, it was for, it was the B sides, mm-hmm. and Chris Lord Algie had mixed the whole record, and I was doing these two B sides, and this guy Peter calls me and he mm-hmm. says, "Hey, would you mix these songs? Because you have a studio and you have a, a cool board." I said, "Yeah, give them to me." He sends them to me. He listens to them, and he goes, "Wow, this sounds so good. It's full. It's rich. It's like a- it's the analog sound I was searching for." And he goes, "Can I come in and, and, and watch how you did it?" And I thought, and I'm like. He thinks I spit that out on the console. I'm like, oh, man, what am I going to tell him? Do I tell him the truth? He shows up, and he goes, okay, show me wh- where everything is. I go, Peter, all I'm really doing is I got this side chain that's coming out on the board, but everything else is in the box. And he goes, don't tell the band. <laughs> and, and I go, why? He goes, because we thought you were mixing on the console. I'm like, well, doesn't it sound like it? He says, yeah, it sounds exactly like it's out of the console then i'm like then don't worry about how i did it um as long as i did it the way you want it um so i mean it's do you reckon go ahead do you reckon part of that quality might be because i know you're a fan of all the ssl eqs and that they're actually oh sorry ssl uh, compressors and they're reasonably probably pretty good these days i use the the plugin for the ssl all the time time. on on drums for sure do you think that's what created do you, th- do you think that's what actually made it sound that way, though? Uh, that made what sound that way? The mixes, those the two B-sides that you mixed, do you think what actually made them have like uh, a console flavor or whatever was you know because what? you've used those SSL compressors? N- you know what? I think the, the commonality is is my ears and the sounds I like to hear and the way I choose the frequencies and the compressions and the things that I do. Because I think... Someone else could have mixed the same thing, the exact same way I did it, but it might not sound the same. It's just it's because I like these kinds of sounds, so I'm gonna chase those sounds um, down. So I, to me, that's how I get that sound is is using that SSL. And the 
the Motorhead records, see, this is, here's the thing that you don't know is all those Motorhead records were all done, they were all mixed on an SSL. They were all spit on the console, except for Motorizer. It's the only one. And I tried to mix one of those in the box, and Lemmy saw that I wasn't moving faders and decided that we should go to a different studio because I wasn't mixing it right. So I, so I had to go to another studio to finish. That would have been a, a Aftershock. We mixed that whole record at A&M Studios where they did the Black Album for Metallica. And it was an E console. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. there weren't flying faders on this console. <clears throat> so he didn't see me moving the faders, even though I was spitting them out on the console. So he'd always seen me mix it on a J, J9000. All those records I did for him were mixed on a J. Um, but those have the faders that mm -hmm. jump up and down. So he... He saw that as me working and me not being lazy, and it sounded better to him because because of that specifically. So, um, my my ideal console would would be to have a J to mix on, if people could just accept the mix right away and or let it sit for for a short period of time. But that's the most. It's more fun to mix it on like a J nine thousand. Like you literally you pull them faders, and when you do a ride, you jump up there. It's like. It's so fun. It's supposed to you take a mouse and you're moving it like a, a, just a little bit, a centimeter here, a centimeter there. After a while, your brain just goes, this isn't fun. This is dumb. I actually bought a, what it's called a fader port. Um, it's basically just one single fader. So when I want to do rides on stuff, I can actually grab a fader and I, I, I do the automation. It automates the Pro Tools. But to me, it made it more yeah. old school. And all of a sudden, it was fun. And then people watch it and they're like, whoa, what's that doing? I'm like... This is why I got into mixing was to, to grab the faders and to move things and um, and enjoy uh, and enjoy what I'm doing because I was really getting tired of moving the mouse and which I still do it every day but uh, mm. it gives me it gives me more pleasure to do that. Awesome. All right. Well, um, that's pretty much all the questions that I've got and I've uh, taken a quite a sizable chunk of your time. I could keep asking questions and. You know, listening to everything forever. But um, I was going to ask: Is there something that you're really passionate about that you like doing other than engineering? Something else you like to spend your spare time doing? Uh, you know what? I like music. Um, I li I I grew up by the beach, so I'm, I'm big into surfing. Um, I once I I started a family. I, I love my family. I love hanging out with my family and doing things with them. Um, hmm. You know, it's just I don't. I don't really have any other hobbies that I do. Music is kind of a hobby as well. It's 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 both. Um, I don't know. It takes up. Yeah. It's most of my life. It's that and my family. That those are the two things that are the most fun to me. And I and I enjoy it. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy yeah. every day. And I I look at myself and I go. Sometimes I'll sit and I'll be like, oh, I got to go mix this song today. And I'll sit down at the board and I'll say, I'm getting paid to mix this song. I'm like, I might even do this for free. Like it's like it's it's that much fun <laughs> you do it, but in general. But then I, I my my the brain kicks me in and goes wait no no you can't do it for free because then you, you can't do this anymore and everything goes away. So then you have to say okay you know what I need to make some sort of money so I can have things. And when people say well, we need this kind of equipment, you need to have some of those things uh, for people to achieve what they want. So um, but yeah I mean that I like hanging out with friends and things like that. It's just. Uh, Sports, I like sports, I like basketball, I like anything like that. Um, don't really watch it as much. I'd rather play sports and do things. I'd rather do than watch almost anything. Sure. But, uh, but here's the thing. I think if, with someone who's getting interested in this, you got to realize that uh, there's life out there and you have to live your life. And if you're just stuck in a studio every single day, all day, all night, you get a different perspective of the world and eventually you get... Some people get too isolated and they get too weird. And to me, you gotta, mm -hmm. you gotta, don't get me wrong, you gotta spend so much time and effort and you gotta love it. But you also have to go to those other things and you have to love those other things too and enjoy just, you know, like I'm gonna go home and probably watch Survivor right now. And what does that do for me? It, <laughs> it takes my brain away from that song I heard 40,000 times today. It takes me away from these discussions and me thinking, like, oh, I should have told Owen this or should have done that. It's like, who cares? We just did what we did. It, it doesn't, there's no should have. Maybe there's another interview another day. You, you say something else. So, um, yeah, I might, might have my shit together a bit better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I 
like come come up with some better questions. I might show up the I might show up the first time, too. I apologize. Yeah. Oh, look. You know, it's all good. There's something else I was going to say, and I forgot now. So that's cool. I better let you go then. All right. Cool. If you need to send me an email or whatever, just whatever, and yeah, I'll get back yeah. to you. No stress, man. All right. Awesome. Cool. Pleasure to meet you. Yeah. Take you care. Too. Cheers. All right. Bye. Bye.